We've spent the last three days in Venice, Louisiana, hunting ducks and wild boar with Blake Itman, a ship pilot and local to the area. This morning, Blake and his offshore fishing buddy, Michael Marcello, are taking us offshore in search of wahoo, the best eating fish in the Gulf. And the goal is to reach the fishing grounds right at sunup. Blake and Michael have charted a course 35 miles offshore to an active oil rig that they've had success with in the past. At first look, it's easy to see that this oil rig is man's thumbprint on the natural world. What you can't see is that underneath the water level of this rig, the structure here is a safe haven which wildlife use to evade predatory attacks. In other words, structure equals fish. Feels like he's done running. I can feel him head shaking. I'm getting back to it. It's been falling a lot. We've only been trolling for five minutes, and already, we got a bite. Ah, steady real. No pumping up and down. Might turn left a little bit. Walk up a little bit, jump on. Walk up to me. To walk me. up the Walk up. Yeah. Line up. Got him? Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Oh, you, baby. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Get back. Things escalated quickly once we got out of the rigs. They put the baits out, we're pulling for what? Five minutes? Yeah. Wahoo takes the bait, and for a little while we didn't quite know what it was, and once it got close we knew exactly what it was. A beautiful, what do you say, how many pounds? Uh, 35 pounds. 35 pound Wahoo. But just look how pretty that fish is. It eats even better. Man, we're not but 10 minutes in, we already got a great fish on the boat, but we got more fishing to do. Gotta get it on ice. From here, are we snipping the gills to bleed them and stuff like that? We're gonna bleed it. We're gonna get it on ice as quick as we can. The sooner we get it on ice, the colder it'll get. You wanna firm these fish up as fast as you can. The, way, the meat will get mushy, but we're gonna get it on ice. Cut up some sashimi later. Lovely. Prime fish. Definitely. Best fish in the Gulf of Mexico right here. So it's good to cut these fish's gills. You see that blood coming out? Get that blood out of the meat real quick. When the meat, when you clean it, you'll see the meat's gonna be very clean. A lot of white meat. You don't want any blood on the meat. You bleed the fish like that. The blood comes out. Make for prime sashimi. Cutting up some wild bellies. Try to get a couple red snappers. Maybe we'll get lucky. Get some groupers. It's red snapper season, and Blake and Michael know where there's a hot snapper bite. For these fish, we use scrap wahoo and mackerel as bait. Wahoo belly. I'm doing all right, despite the dark energies that I see and feel. Don't be the doctor. Maybe Wherever we fish, we need to stay because the fish will come to us. All right. Red snapper are like a perfect top off to a wahoo in the box. And they're always around, they're thick, they're easy to catch, and they're delicious to eat.
That right there is gonna be the last one for the day. I think it's time to head in. We're gonna cook some of this stuff up later tonight. Chef's gonna help us out over here. We've caught our daily limit of snapper. And on the way back from offshore, we'll stop by the water town where Blake spent much of his childhood. Pilot Town, Louisiana. I'm a ship pilot on the Mississippi River. The local waters are known by pilots and the ships need pilots to get the ships up the river safely. You have narrow channels, shallow water, and a long trip that the captains of the ships just aren't capable of doing. So when they arrive, a pilot gets on board, takes them up the river, loads, and when they go outbound, they take a pilot outbound and we get on three to four miles offshore. We take control of the ship and we pilot the ship up the river safely. We are the pilots that take them from the Gulf up to Pilot Town. Prior to all the hurricanes in the early 1900s, say, there was numerous water towns down here that were only accessible by boat. These were towns where people lived. They had Ostrica, they had Belize, they had Port Eads, they had Burwood, Pilotown. And every hurricane, the town's kind of Camille came and knocked out of town. Betsy came, knocked out another town. And uh, Pilot Town was the last of the water towns. Ultimately, Katrina came and finally took Pilot Town. Um, but Pilot Town was everything to me and my family. It still is everything, and, and that's why I'm glad y'all are here to kind of document a place that was incredible and provided so much happiness for a small number of people, but also a history that's kind of lost, which happens in most places when a hurricane rolls through and washes it out. You really don't hear much about it. You know, it's on the news and after a couple months, it's old news and the town's gone. My grandparents' house was right here. Imagine a grass yard and a fence. And that's my grandparents' house back there. It got washed back into the marsh. My camp was right here off our right side. That was our camp. Just a completely different situation than what most people deal with today. Like, nobody drove cars down here. You rode your bike up and down the road, you walked up and down the road. If you had to go get groceries, got in the boat, went up in town. And uh, just a totally different atmosphere, totally different type of living. That's something that's been lost down here, hurricane after hurricane, Camille, Betsy, Katrina, everything just kind of gets destroyed slowly. You're losing the land and the towns are just working their way north. And Venice is where you're at now, but 50 years from now, you don't know what it's gonna be. What can you do?
Keep on keeping on. Back at the camp, we all play our part in processing coolers of Sheep's Head, Snapper, and Wahoo. I'm gonna have to redo the whole thing when you told me it was 35 pounds. <laughs> all right, so we tried to clean this Wahoo. We got it bled on the boat. We just gutted it. And basically a Wahoo is a long, slender fish. It's gonna have a bloodline running right in the middle. This is a loin of flesh here. You're obviously gonna have the stomach and then it's gonna turn into another loin here. So I like to just come all the way to the top of the head because that fillet runs all the way to right here. Come down to the stomach and then I outline the fish all the way to the top all the way down to the tail, ba barely going in with my knife. I'm not trying to really fillet the fish at this point. I'm trying to separate the skin from the actual frame of the fish. And at this point, you got two options. One, you can take the whole fillet. The fish is so big that it's easier to manage it in chunks, I guess you could say. So we always denote enough to fit into a gallon Ziploc. So we'll say, you know, one, two, three, four, five pieces off of, it, off of this one side. So we just come down all the way to hit the backbone. And then we can separate this belly off coming around the bone, like so. So, as you can see, you know, this is where the, the second loin's gonna start and the first loin's gonna begin, and then gonna work, work my rest of the way down the fish. That center cut of this fish is like, gotta look at the steakiness to oh, it, it's, right? It's, it always ends up in my bag somehow, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't you understand don't know it. how you get the center cut. I don't, I don't, I don't understand. Yeah. It, just, it just ends up with me every time. I feel like if you clean the fish, you should have your pick. And then like Blake's doing, immediately drying it off. That's important. You know, moisture on fish, especially pelagic fish, is a sin. All right, so all we're going to do is just flip the fish over and repeat the same process, just like we did on the other side. And we'll end up with a pile of fish. It's nice having so many good cooks at the camp. I'm taking the night off while Junior makes sheep's head fish cakes and Blake slices up the wahoo we caught this morning for duck camp nigiri. All right, so today we split up in two groups. Some of us went inshore fishing to catch some inshore fish and some of us went offshore. I will be smoking some sheep head fillets that me and Jay caught and turning them into fish cakes as well as some smothered potatoes. And then JP, Blake, and Steven will be making sushi rolls with the Wahoo and Snapper that they caught today as well. Let's get started. I'm gonna get started on the potatoes. First, we're gonna start off by quartering up some bacon. We're gonna cook that bacon down, render the fat down real good. And then once that bacon gets to a nice crunchy texture, we're gonna pull it out and finish it at the end as like a bacon bit on top of the potatoes. Now that the bacon has been pulled out, we add in a stick of butter to turn into a brown butter. And then we're gonna go ahead and add our onion, whites of the green onion, and our garlic. We're gonna let this just cook down, get real nice and dark and smothered down. And then we'll go ahead and add our potatoes and just keep letting it cook down slow, slow, slow. When you're cooking sushi rice, it's really important to wash it. You want that water to be clear. You can poke it, you see how water gets a little cloudy. What does that do? I really don't know, I don't know. That's what the directions say. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now that our fish has cooled off, we're gonna go ahead and start the process of flaking it off the skin. And you wanna keep it in big chunks so whenever you mix it all, it doesn't fall apart into just mush. With fish as fresh as this, it's important to not overcomplicate things. So while Junior cooks up dinner, Blake is slicing up some fresh wahoo for some duck camp nigiri. This is a jar. Crunchy garlic with chili oil. Can't be bad to go around here. Wow. How them fish gays going, boy? Finishing that last batch now, chef. Need a scoop of mamas? Where are you holding them suckers at? One scoop. Woo! Golly! That's golden brown delicious right there, boy. Ah. Junior's Cajun Kitchen, boy. Junior's Cajun Kitchen, coming in hot, taking over the scene. Who needs me, man? Give this man a show. It could have been ready a little bit earlier. Yeah, they're freaking nice. Southern Louisiana culture, it's all different than just Southern culture. Different type of food and, and everything. The, the, it's, it's just amazing the food they cook and how good it is. And it's off the land. And it even gets better when it's off the land. You know, that, and the fun that comes with it and the parties that come with it, and it, it's just incredible. The, everybody loves it once they come down. They come down to visit and they just, they come back to see us again. And we have our troubles too, but we have mostly all good down here. Great people like Blake and his friends. It, it, that just rubs off on everybody. Walking hot, steamy street, trying to ease my mind. Came on down to this river town, to see what I could find. We've been going hard these last few days, and we're all looking forward to the Chivo Rodeo tonight, where the only thing we have to worry about catching is a buzz. An original, so a Chivo is somebody who comes from town and has no idea what they're doing. They go to the marina, they back their boat up and crook it in the launch and clog the launch. They're wearing the PFG shirts. They just look like a clown. They know who they are. We know who they are. You could spot them from a mile away. And my friends got a hold of it, and they all started kind of calling each other Chivos. And so we initially started the Summer Chivo Rodeo, which is uh, usually about 100, 120 people come down, have a big fishing rodeo in my backyard, fireworks. We get a band, and uh, it's just a good time. So we eventually started, we decided one Chivo per year wasn't enough. And so we do winter Chivo now, which is just my tight knit group of friends. And uh, we get tuned up and have a good time. And that's what we're about to do. You gotta work hard and you gotta party hard. And good food, good drink, good music, everything. And you party, you party right. Like the chicken you hear there, She's partying, laying an egg right now. She's happy. <laughs> Late in the evening, cold, cold bed's keeping. But with enough heat to stir and start a flame. We spend the season chasing and drinking. All the spirits here that keep us on the way. Born down the bayou, raised in the basin. My mama and my papa showed me the ways. Of cornbread bacon, don't burn the bacon, but keep the grease for the night for cooking late. And we were chasing down in the basin, 
Much more than just a few birds up in the sky My father shook me What is that strong hand? A place where memories never seem to die That's it, folks, from Venice, Louisiana. We came for a meat haul, and a meat haul we got. I'm leaving with coolers full of ducks, hogs, red snapper, and wahoo. It was incredible to see Blake and his Duck Camp Dennis crew do Venice, Louisiana. Now, we're off to southwest Louisiana to the Cajun rice prairies. See y'all next time. Thank you for having me. My name is, uh, my name is Bayou D. Uh, I'll be here all night, guys. Please give it up for Brandon. He was, he was great tonight. Uh, he was a great host. Uh, I don't know if I must have paid him, but I'm here now. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Merry Christmas, guys. If y'all want to hear Christmas tunes, tell my boy Blake. Let's go. All the way to the back. 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 On the next episode of Duck Camp Dinners, the crew gets speckle belly fever. Speckle bellies, baby! We learn about soft and spicy cracklings and talk about the relationship between crawfish and waterfowl. Shoot straight and come hungry.